I think we need more than imprimatur. I think you actually, DFAT needs to put themselves in the mind of the other actors in the system that, ne that need to be on board to make the NCP really perform. And that is your faculty deans, your head of schools, people who have the authority over creating those curriculum embedded pathways to the Indo-Pacific and think what's in it for them. We need, there needs to be something in it for them. At the moment, the NCP spend is really all on the demand side, all deliberately by intention built into the DNA of the program to go straight into the pockets of students and to subsidise all those travel costs. I don't think we need really any more money on the demand side of trying to make it more attractive for students. G'day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm your host, Rob Malicki, coming today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. And it's a week on from what many international educators in Australia will look back on as perhaps one of the darkest nights of the year. And I'm, of course, talking about Budget Night 2024. And amongst you know a few good announcements in regards to cleaning up dodgy agents and the like, the Australian government brought in those, uh, the words we have been not wanting to hear for a long time, caps on international students. But as the dust settled on Budget Night... A colleague who's well known around the industry popped up online and highlighted perhaps the best bit of news in the Australian government's budget. And I'd like to welcome back to Global Horizons, Liam Prince, the Australian Consortium for In-Country Indonesian Studies. Liam, welcome back to Global Horizons. Thanks, Rob. Glad to be here. Good to have you, mate. And what was that nice bit of news that made at least part of our sector have a deep sigh of relief on post-budget morning? Yeah, you had to squint to look for some of the good news on budget night for those of us in international education. So we'll take the, the wins where we can get them. I think the bit of news you're referring to is the renewed government commitment to the new Colombo plan, which is the sort of flagship program from the Australian government to support Australian domestic undergrads to undertake learning abroad or study abroad in the Indo-Pacific. So that's been, was brought in in 2014, has been running since 2014 and in the budget across the forward estimate, so forward three years, there's the commitment to the NCP at its current funding level, its funding envelope of $50 million. Actually, 2024-25 represents the first year since the pandemic where funding for the NCP has actually returned to that full $50 million. It was kind of tapered down during the pandemic in acknowledgement that students were unable to travel offshore for the last couple of years. So that's, I think, a win and we'll take it. Should definitely take it. For those people who haven't heard of the NCP before, maybe let's just provide a little bit more detail about how the program's structured. So do you want to talk a little bit about those kind of two components of the NCP? Sure. As you said, there's two elements to the NCP, which speak really of the origin story of the new Colombo plan and a little bit of, I don't know about contention, but some disagreement at the beginning as to what exactly the NCP was going to be. There was a bit of tension between the architects of the NCP, namely the Prime Minister at the time, Tony Abbott, and the Foreign Minister at the time, Julie Bishop with, I think, as I understand it, Julie Bishop arguing for a sort of mass entry program, mass mobility program that would fund thousands of students to make a learning abroad experience in the Indo-Pacific, a quote-unquote rite of passage for Australian undergrad students, with the vision that the Prime Minister at the time had to for a quote-unquote road scholarship for the Indo-Pacific. So what we've ended up with is a compromise where we have a, on the one hand, a scholarship program, the New Colombo Plan Scholarship Program, which funds between 100 and 150 uh, new NCP scholars for periods of study and internship of up to 18 months, and they're quite high value scholarships. So I think under the current guidelines, it's up to $87,000 per student um, to, to fund that activity. And so again, there's 100 to 150 of those awarded each funding round, annual funding round. And then we have, on the other hand, a New Colombo Plan Mobility Program, which is more in line with what the former Foreign Minister's vision was, which was a mass program funding thousands of students every year to go out on what are overwhelmingly short-term experiences of between two and four weeks under that mobility program. And that original, that overall funding envelope of $50 million is split between those two programs, not quite equally, but, but has to do the work of funding both those programs. Yeah, and of course, the NCP when it was um, introduced, was really positioned as an important piece of Australia's soft diplomacy efforts across the Indo-Pacific region. And I guess much like the um, Erasmus program in the European Union has done over decades and decades and decades, encouraging our young people to cross borders with our nearest neighbours 
you know, it has fantastic benefits across a long time span. So it was awesome in those early days listening to Julie Bishop just loudly advocate for this experience for young people to cross waters and have those experiences, build those linkages. And her vision, as you as you mentioned before, was this should be in perpetuity, hopefully something that isn't just for a couple of years or hopefully for decades and decades to come. And I guess to that end, it was it was very encouraging, wasn't it, when there was the change of government a couple of years ago that this funding was maintained. Yeah, look, I should predicate this whole discussion, Rob, as every conversation I have about the new Colombo plan is before we get into how is it going, what's it doing, what's its impact, consequently, I need to state up front total personal support for the initiative and any suggestions or criticism is after I say, you know, my top line messaging would be, please keep the media columbus saying, please keep it, please keep it, please keep it. It's doing wonderful, wonderful work, which we can get into. But I agree. So the announcement, the budget announcement last week is, I mean, in and of itself, good. It means the funding will be there next year and the, the year after the year after the year after. But what is really satisfying is what appears to be the solidification of bipartisan support for the idea of the Australian government putting funding on the table to incentivise Australian undergraduates to head up to the Indo-Pacific for study. I think the consolidation of bipartisan support for that kind of expenditure is, you know, took probably a generation to consolidate and we should take full advantage of it while we have that bipartisan support behind it. I agree with that. And I think, you know, leadership is so important in these things. Obviously, Julie Bishop was a key driver of the program, came up with the idea, implemented it, and then loudly advocated it for many years. But now we have a, you know, Senator Penny Wong, who's also, I think, doing a fantastic job as foreign minister. I mean, you, you look at the speed at which she was out into the region after the last election, building bridges, deepening relationships and the like. And of course, her father was an original Colombo plan scholar. So I feel like I'm not sure to what extent that that influences her her thinking, but clearly she's a long-term player and can see how this is valuable for Australia's relationships. And, and I think we're fortunate to have had those those two fantastic foreign ministers really driving this over such a long period of time. Well, look, I am, well, I wouldn't and couldn't argue with any of that, Rob. I would just point to, I mean, the last time I was on your podcast, I was talking about Asian languages in schools. I think we have the counter in that when we we have a national initiative like trying to do something about Asian language education in schools. And you can see what happens when we don't have bipartisan support for a long-term national project like that. And we have this kind of sine wave of enthusiasm um, for that. That means there's funding when there's a, you know, one party in power and then it gets cut and there's no continuity. And in fact, you know, for a period in the 80s and 90s, we had consolidation of political support for Asian languages in schools, and then it went away, and we've had 20 years of just drought in terms of policy focus and, and funding that particular project. So, yeah, an illustrative counterexample to the to the NCP, which we're, again, I think, at least for now, we have bipartisan support. Since that's come up, what's what's the solve on that, Liam? What's the solution? Or which? In your view. The languages in schools. <laughs> I'm not... I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a politician, Rob. I mean, if I can conjure up bipartisan support for what to me seems a a pretty clear national interest, you know, priority that Australia should have a better understanding of its regional neighbours. And part of that element, as I've made the case in multiple forums, including this one, is about a significant number of Australians doing the time of of trying to learn a language of of, of one of our neighbours. That to me shouldn't be a a partisan issue. It should just be self-evident, but historically has been owned by one side of politics rather than another. I really don't know the fix for that other than to keep laying out that clear, what in fairly non-partisan terms, that it's just a, within our, it's it's in our national interest just as much as purchasing military kit. I guess an embrace of, a, as I've made before, a, a case before, a more holistic sense of our security of the region. I think it needs to be, that case needs to be made over and over and, and eventually people in power need to kind of hear it and put some funding back into the system and back particularly into the school system to get that back on on track. So, Liam, we've had you on the podcast before talking about the importance of Asian languages in schools. Do you feel there's a role for the NCP to play in some way in that space? That is a great question, Rob. Yeah, definitely have some thoughts on this particular issue. I've had the privilege of, in recent years, being invited to um, participate in the a national, what is it called? The NCP reference group, which is sort of meant to be a voice from the sector to DFAT and the bits of DFAT in responsible for running the new Colombo plan. 
And in fact, there were some expressed questions when there was a change of government in, in May 20 coming out of that process to the sector, which specifically asked the sector, how could the NCP better serve the incoming government's statement of intent around doing something about Asian language literacy in Australia and improving Australia's Asia literacy capabilities. And within that context, yeah, I provided some thoughts and have been refining those since over the last 18 months. Now, I actually think that the NCP can only do so much. It, it, DFAT can't run Australia's education policy. That portfolio belongs to the, properly to the Department of Education. And there is a sense in which right from the beginning, the NCP has been a kind of guerrilla incursion by the foreign affairs into you know, the Department of Education's Ballywick or, or remit. And so we have to be conscious of those those limitations. And you have to think that the the NCP is really an intervention right at, if not the end of the educational pipeline, but quite far along the educational pipeline. It's coming in right at the end. If I could just, the basic core of my comment to DFAT when asked that question, how can the NCP, NCP serve the interests of sort of Asian language literacy, was to say, really, unfortunately, it's duration, duration, duration. It's duration of, of learning abroad in the region. And instantly, we're kind of on a slightly contentious issue within the sector around Indo-Pacific experiences. Remembering the description I gave you of the NCP, which is on the one hand, we have these scholars, these 100 to 150 scholars going up up to 18 months, and we have the mobility program funding overwhelmingly short-term experiences of two to four weeks. Now, if we're talking specifically narrowly about language acquisition, there is a limit to what a student can do in terms of language acquisition in two to four weeks. Now, I'm conscious of a whole lot of other views in the sector and work being done on the utility of two to four week experiences en masse in the Indo-Pacific. There's a whole lot of great stuff around access to those experiences, equity of access to those experiences. There's a real role for the NCP to provide those initial penny drop experiences of introducing students to the world. And I don't want to get in the way of that. But if I could, because I care about the numbers of these things, if I could just quickly talk about impact and, and, and the numbers of, of NCP. If we look back to 2019, which is kind of where we got to before the pandemic and, and the work of the NCP had been ramping up year on year since 2014. But in 2019, we had something like 15,000 Australian undergraduate students head up to the Indo-Pacific for any kind of experience. Now, of those 15,000 students, 92% of them were on experiences of two to four weeks. So that's 92%, the overwhelming majority of them. That, was, that leaves about 1,100 students nationally, domestic undergrads, that were doing experiences of a semester or longer, where we're talking very small numbers. If you think about a, a domestic uh, student population, about 1.1 million, you know, it's 0.001 or something, but very, very small numbers. And I think for those of us not really familiar with the NCP, that's not probably what we would expect. It's not quite the description that was on the tin at the beginning of the, the, the whole project in 2014. And particularly if you think about some of the statements of intent within the NCP, which is about building peer-to-peer networks in the Indo-Pacific and perhaps doing something around you know, acquisition of cultural agility and linguistic ability. So I've been really focused on how do we start from that very small base of 1,100 students a year? It'd be less this year. And I mean, it was less last year because we're still trying to build the sector outbound mobility up from the from the pandemic. But how do we focus in on that, those 1,100 students and see if we can within, you know, the next two, three, four, five years, take that from a, a very modest 1,100 students and try and get it up to something like 2,200 students. And I think I think there are things that we could do within the sector, within within the settings of the NCB to, to better instrumentalise the universities to deliver that kind of outcome. DFAT. I agree with you. And I sat on the NCP reference group for, for seven years. So for, right from the very earliest days of the sort of design committee, the the, the reference group through, through that process. And there was always a lot of conversation about that short versus long and acknowledgements that short experience, I like how you call it the penny drop. I, I call it like, you know, the, throwing the stone into a, into a, into a pond as you see it splash and, you know, those short experiences give that splash. But then like the really meaty, chunky impact comes from those scholars who are in region for like 18 to 19 months. And you have this fine balancing act between trying to enable lots of students, but then also get that deep impact. And there is good evidence that short leads to long, you know, that people that start off with, on a mobility experience then get highly motivated to kind of pursue into longer experiences and even, you know, apply to become, to become scholars. So I think DFAT has been doing a really good job in that sense of trying to foster that. This is a bigger cultural issue, isn't it? Which is just the sort of Australian psyche where traditionally we were 
running off to America, UK, all the English speaking places, and maybe not traveling so much within our own region. And maybe it's just that kind of unknown, you know, about the fact that there are some excellent you know, educational institutions where you can easily go and do six months or a year on exchange. The number of the submissions I'm working on at the moment is really, I think, I think there are some demand side issues that you were mentioning about, which is about students' inclination to, and, and ability to take off and go for, for longer periods of time. It's quite a commitment. You have to leave commitments behind at home. There's a whole lot of opportunity costs that come with uh, longer duration learning abroad. But actually what I'm looking at at the moment are the sort of the supply side limitations to those experiences because I actually think they're probably equally or more meaningful in terms of limiting the number of students. And what I mean by that, Rob, is, okay, look, I have to declare interest, right? Yeah, so I'm up here in Jogjakarta at the moment. I'm visiting a, a teacher's offices up here. And we have, this semester, we, we only have 15 students on our semester programs here in Jogjakarta. That, those numbers should be 30, 40, 50. I mean, Rob, when I did my a teacher's semester in the year 2000, there were 60 of us up here. And that was when a teacher's was a much smaller organization with hardly, with far, far fewer resources devoted to marketing and student recruitment, putting those opportunities in front of Australian students. And a big part of what's happened in those 20 years is the drying up of the curriculum embedded pathways to a semester in the Indo-Pacific that were built into degree structures 20 years ago. So the real nub of the submission is saying, well, how do we reopen? What would it take to reopen those dedicated pathways that are never going to be super high volume? You know, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, they're not huge high volume programs, but we do have those programs. They do persist a handful of universities. So there's a couple of case studies that um, we're using in the submission. Number one is um, ANU's uh, Semester in Asia program and uh, the Semester and Year in Asia program. They've got a two-track program. Yeah, great program. And UTS's Bachelor of International Studies, which is a kind of combined undergrad, postgrad, five-year combination, which has a semester or a uh, year in a uh, year abroad embedded in it. And those two institutions alone, I cross-referencing with the AUIDF data from the last you know three or four years before the pandemic, I think those institutions alone probably accounted for between ten and fifteen percent annually of Australia's total domestic undergraduates heading off to the Indo Pacific for a semester or more. So, to my mind, the question is. Again, should DFAT want to do it, or the Australian government more broadly, what funding settings within the NCP or external to the NCP, adjacent to the NCP, would you need to change in order to give, create a revenue sing- signal to the universities to actually go the extra distance of either creating the, those curriculum-embedded pathways to the Indo-Pacific or maintaining the ones that they've got. Because what the Australian government is asking or DFAT is asking the universities to do is something additional to just teaching the domestic cohort on, on shore. And, and as we know, you know, the Australian universities are pretty canny. They're pretty economically rational actors and they don't generally do anything for free, you know, or they don't do anything that they could do in a more cost-effective way. And the reality is, and I know this from being in the trenches and trying to negotiate, taking small handfuls of domestic students out of you know classrooms onshore in Australia and get them up to the Indo-Pacific, the faculty deans, the heads of schools, the school managers that I talk to generally say, why? You know, what's in it for the... I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I'm saying this in more sort of brutal terms than... You know, universities obviously have other, you know, value-driven activity that they participate in, but from a strictly economic rational perspective it doesn't often make sense to send a handful of students or to create a whole separate degree stream or, or course program that serves the interests of the ncp they're not going to do that without a good reason or, or some case that's the, an economic case that stacks up it's interesting though because like there are some fantastic models out there i mean obviously the long-term degree program options that you've mentioned anu and uts but even thinking about Curtin's Go Global program, which is for students doing allied health style degrees, where they can go to various areas around the region and do clinical placement work, which yep. is incredibly difficult to get ticked off for accreditation purposes. But not yep. only has Curtin managed to get that up, it's been running for decades now. Incredibly impactful program. I think some of those programs have been supported by NCP funding in the last decade, but it was already up and running well before that. Yeah, and that sort of comes to that that supply side that you're talking about. Learning abroad specialists know how much of a barrier that can be. Just having a lack of easy opportunities for students to go and 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 get those experiences in in the Indo Pacific attached back to their degree. So sometimes like imprimatur is enough to make this stuff happen, isn't it? It's like and, and look full full credit. Sorry, I wanted to say up front, full credit to DFAT for for the work they've done building the NCP. 
mm. I was always blown away by the innovation, the efficiency of DFAT in building this 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 program from from scratch. I mean, leveraging knowledge from the Department of Ed at the time, of course, but but then actually building out the whole NCP. But now, just having the imprimatur behind that program. And being able to say, hey, look, we, you know, some of the things we'll prioritize will be you know, almost boring stuff like, like the degree structures, you know, institutions where they're building degree structures to create long-term sustainable pathways. That might be an easier way to, you know, facilitate more movement. So I think we need more than an imprimatur because I think what, and again, look, I agree with what you've said about the, the commitment from DFAT and even the responsiveness to kind of tweaking the, the program. Uh, over the years so this again i offer this input in the spirit of you know maximizing the impact of the the spend on the ncp i think we need more than imprimatur i think you actually defat needs to put themselves in the mind of the other actors in the system that that need to be on board to make the ncp really perform and that is your faculty deans your head of schools people who have the authority over creating those curriculum embedded pathways to the indo-pacific and think what's in it for them we need there needs to be something in it for them at the moment the ncp spend is really all on the demand side all deliberately by intention built into the dna of the program to go straight into the pockets of students and to subsidize all those travel costs i don't think we need really any more money on the demand side of trying to make it more attractive for students i mean i'm happy to hear arguments on that but i think any new spend on it or reprioritize spend actually needs to be around aligning the incentive structure of those head of schools or those faculty deans, the administrators. And some of that I know runs counter to some of the hesitance at the beginning of the NCP, which is we, we don't want the NCP to be this sort of grubby backdoor for those unis to get more you know money out of the government. Uh, rah, rah, rah. But I think without attending to the incentive structure of the people that hold the keys to the pathways to the semester, to a semester or longer in the Indo-Pacific, I think there's only limited utility in trying to keep offering these, you know, NCP student demand, you know, so these NCP grants to boost student demand for programs that don't really exist. Interesting conversation. We could keep going on that. But I wanted to come to this analysis that you've done after budget, the budget was released, and you've created a, a really nice graphic here. And I'll make sure I share the link to this in the description of the podcast. For those of you listening along, I would really strongly suggest jump on the podcast description, hit the link to open up the chart that Liam's created because it's one of those fascinating visualizations we occasionally get in international education. Shout out to Kerry Ramirez for the work he does visualizing data. But this is a beautiful visualization of Australian government spend on the NCP over the last decade broken down by destination. So firstly, mate, thank you for doing the heavy lifting on this. And I guess maybe just to open up on this, like what surprised you most when you finished off this chart and you hit create and boom, here was the result. I think what jumped out at me the most was the variability in the amount of money, amount of funding provided through that mobility program. If you think of again, the the two halves of the program being the scholars on the one hand of the mobility scheme. In 2018, which was the fourth year, yeah, the fourth year of the NCP, there was something like $58 million of funding for projects, NCP mobility projects. So that, that being the peak of the spend on the NCP. And I went back and checked the, I double checked the 2018 data that I'd got from a colleague, shout out to Daniel Mather at Murdoch. And it's there. I mean, there, there was a huge number of projects funded at funding round. And I, I, I suspect it had something to do with the initial four year funding envelope and then having from 14 to 18 and having a bunch of funding they needed to, to allocate, allocate in 2018. So, you know, $48 million or something under that 218 round, but it's, and then last year, there was only $15 million allocated through the through the NCP mobility program, which, I mean, I've got my theories as to probably why, why that was. I think there's probably a bit of fungibility between the two sides of the program. And if they want to fund more scholars and they can put more money on the scholarship side one year, which means there's less available for the mobility program. But I think that variability, that lumpiness of, of funding from year to year does make it difficult for, for the Australian universities in the sector because that funding is coming sort of in a lumpy fashion. It's very hard to absorb, you know, ramp up one year and have hundreds, thousands of projects going and then for there only be a very small pot of funding the next year. You know, ideally, you know, it would it would come in a bit, bit more of a smooth fashion so that the, the outbound mobility sector could absorb it and manage it. So I think it's probably the, the biggest thing that um, stuck out to me. But then secondarily, I think it's probably where the funding has gone in terms of destination. And so it was interesting that under the new Colombo plan, there are 40 eligible Indo-Pacific destinations, but 50% of all of the funding 
uh, that has been allocated since 2015 or between the 10 funding rounds between 2015 and 2024. 50% of the funding have gone to just five destinations, which I think were Indonesia, in front of you, Rob, uh, Indonesia, China, India, Japan, and Vietnam is next on the list here. Does that sound right? Yeah, that does sound right. So I should have had it up in front of me. And uh, so that's 50% to those five destinations. And then the next five destinations accounting for the next 25%. So you've got 10% the 10 destinations accounting for 75% of the funding awarded in the 10 funding rounds of the new combo plan mobility program accounting for yeah or, uh, the, the lion's share of that funding. And in total I think a bit over 330 million dollars that's been allocated through the new Colombo plan mobility program since 2015. Awesome isn't it? So I'm just thinking back. I mean you've been in this game a long time but so have I just thinking back to the like the, the 2000s, and the late 2000s, and the idea that at some point in our lifetime, the Australian government would have spent a, across, you know, this mobility program, scholarship program, probably half a billion dollars mm. on, on, on learning abroad in the region is just is just awesome. It's such, such great progress. It is. It's a significant investment. And yeah, I think, I mean, again, I hope it continues and we'll be counting in, I guess, the policymakers and, and bureaucrats will be measuring the impact of this for, for decades to come. And ad, and people like myself, advocates, will be trying to highlight, I guess, the, the long-term dividends resulting from that in, investment. There have been some very good exegetious people who've been doing research in this space. A little shout out to them. There's a number of people working on that at the moment. We have Elena Williams, who's actually just finishing up a PhD at ANU at the moment, who's been writing her PhD on both alumni impacts, but also host community impacts, looking at roughly 30 years of exegetious programs in in Indonesia uh, as her primary case study, but and, and particularly looking at the, those students in the last decade or so have been receiving NCP support. Yeah, and alongside Ellie, of course, you've got Lee Tran down at Deakin University. She's been a guest on the podcast talking about her journey to Australia as a researcher, but obviously a very active researcher around the NCP and it's produced some great work. And then, of course, shout out to Davina Potts, who did some seminal work around the value of short-term experiences. That's coming up to almost a decade ago, I think now. She's been Dr. Potts for a while now, so congratulations she, to Davina. She has. Yeah, shout out to Davina. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe just to wrap up, I might ask you for a prediction. Prediction about the future, and it could be NCP, but perhaps just more broadly, what you're seeing from your vantage point coming on the horizon. Well, my major prediction, not particularly controversial, but this region, you know, it's nice to be talking to you from John Jakarta. It's not going anywhere, Rob. I mean, Australia's future a significant part of it and its place in the world is going to be tied up with the the fate of places like Indonesia and the politics and society. It's an incredibly exciting place to be. There's a thrum and a pulse and a hum in Jakarta and Jogja and, you know, Indonesia's going places. And yeah, I don't know, maybe not a China level, early 2000s hurry, but certainly moving a pace. And Australia needs to be in the mix. You know, Australians need to be in the mix. They need to be up in, in places like Indonesia, forming friendships, forming you know, professional networks, and we can't really afford to not be in the game, I think. And so something like the NCP is a great step towards that. And I think if we can get more students up here spending spending longer, more significant time during their formative years, so they can go and build some kind of career, a career based in the Indo-Pacific or in connection with the Indo-Pacific, I think it's going to be very significant and deliver a dividend in terms of Australia's national interest. And that would be my Prediction, watch the Indo-Pacific. Not saying anything new. We know this and we say it over and over again, but it's a project you've got to measure in, in, in decades and centuries, I guess. So, yeah, that's my prediction. One last question. There was obviously a very important election in Indonesia recently. New president-elect after Jokowi, who'd been there 10 years. God, that went fast, didn't it? What do you see, though, for those who know nothing about Indonesia, the politics, the country, its engagement with the rest of the region... What sort of changes do you think this will make in the short term? Let's just stick on the short term. We're in the kind of wait and see period. Obviously, the election was in February and there's this long, well, I guess it's sort of, yeah, long transition. I was going to say lame duck period, but, you know, Jokowi has got many ideas. He's trying to bed down before his term finishes. So we're in this sort of wait and see period about what the new president under uh, presidency under Prabowo Subiato is going to look like and speaking to a lot of friends and colleagues up here, you know, there's a bit of apprehension about uh, what it is and what it means. Um, I mean, obviously, we all have to respect the decision made by the Indonesian people when they voted in the first round victory for Prabowo Subianto. He's not an un- unproblematic figure I and mean, he has connections, family and professional connections back to the dictatorship under Suharto, the military dictatorship. So there's a lot of worry about democratic, further democratic regression and could be unwinding of 
the huge amount of progress in terms of democratization and recovery from a period of military dictatorship. So, but it's too way, way too early. You can speak to people, kind of the optimists who say, you know, Indonesia's come far too far in the last 20, 25 years to, to return to anything like, you know, the authoritarianism, the authoritarianism of the Suharto era and that the democratic growth is too sort of embedded to have that all reversed. But it's fair to say there's particularly amongst the sort of politically engaged and tertiary educated community, you know, people, watchers of Indonesian politics, yeah, a bit of concern, you know, to, to a bit of apprehension about what, what could happen. We will watch with great interest. Liam, always a pleasure to chat and thank you for joining me on Global Horizons. Ah, oh, it's always fun, Rob. Thanks so much for having me. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by the Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, the Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to the Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.